science has taken centre stage since COVID-19 was declared a pandemic earlier this year. We've all hung on the words of researchers and epidemiologists coming to terms in real time with a new coronavirus. So let's explore the meaning of science in the age of COVID-19. Earlier this afternoon, Professor Salim Abdul Karim, co-chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, on COVID-19 took part in a virtual discussion and he joins us now. Good evening, Prof. Always great to chat to you. I know that um, also on that panel was Dr. Anders Tegnell, who's Sweden's state epidemiologist. We know that Sweden took quite a controversial and different approach to COVID-19. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, how that's paying off for them. And if you compare their approach and South Africa's approach, uh, do you think that we could have considered a different approach? Yes, good evening, Sally, and good evening to all the viewers. Uh, today's discussion was part of the Nobel-inspired lectures, and we pay tribute to the Nobel Prize winners who uh, received the Nobel Prize for their work on CRISPR-Cas9 and on hepatitis C. Uh, so Dr. Tegnell and I discussed our individual countries' responses and some of the challenges we face and how science has, has changed. And, you know, within Sweden, uh, they have a very different kind of approach to the way in which they respond to voluntary requests from government. Mm. And he described, for example, that, you know, 98% of people will follow uh, a request by government for voluntary immunization, which is not usual in most other countries. And so they are able to do things that are different. But, you know, they have come under quite substantial attack because of their very poor outcomes. And particularly this last week, when, you know, Sweden refused and uh, wrote to the European Union attacking their or questioning their decision to promote mask wearing. So, you know, one has to look at the evidence and make decisions. And in Sweden, they've made them in a particular way where mask wearing is not required and not even promoted in the way in which it's done in the rest of the world. So I think those are among the challenges. Could we have done things differently? For sure. I think when we look at the scarcity of data available and we were making important decisions, and I made that point in my lecture, that there were only three articles I could find in the entire literature on lockdown. And none of them answer the question of when do you have a lockdown? How strict should it be? How long should it be? Nothing. There is no evidence. It is, you know, you have to make judgments that go with more with your experience and general knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And it was happening all in real time. And ordinary citizens were hearing about scientific breakthroughs or so-called scientific breakthroughs. There was also a lot of fake news. So um, I'm sure that part of the challenge and part of the, the issue was muddied by that fake news. Because while it's been a big year for science, the issue of conspiracy theories, how the virus began, uh, what treatments work, was a real challenge. Did you discuss the impact that fake news had on trying to put science first? We certainly did, Sally. And uh, you know, when we were talking about you know, the newfound meaning of science in the era of COVID-19, one of our big challenges is the, you know, the amount of fake news. Uh, well, let's, let's say it's, it's inconsistent or inaccurate. And a lot of the news has been promoting conspiracy theories. And so I quoted a recent study done by Cornell University in the United States where they analyzed 38 million newspaper articles that were in online or in print. And what they showed was 1.1 million of those articles had completely inaccurate information, uh, in information that was often based on conspiracy theories. And they also did an analysis as what the main source of those conspiracy theories were. And they analyzed it and, and showed that actually the main source of inaccurate information and conspiracy theories is actually the president of the United States. So, you know, it is concerning that when you've got that kind of situation, that science has to take on a new role. Mm. It's, it's, its role's got to be that it's got to present the facts as they are to challenge all of these conspiracy theories. It's interesting that you mentioned the president of the United States. Of course, he has just 
uh, come out of hospital after testing positive for COVID-19. Uh, I'm really interested to get your view on his treatment regime. He was put on dexamethasone and remdesivir. Um, my understanding is that only a patient with COVID pneumonia would, would get that treatment. But interestingly, also, he didn't receive hydroxychloroquine, and we know that he was touting that as something really important to take. That wasn't even mentioned in any of the updates. But the fascinating aspect of the treatment is this antibody cocktail called Regeneron. Now, my understanding is he was possibly the first person in the world to get that, but now there's talk that it could be made available. What do you know about it? Is it the sort of miracle that Trump claims it is? Is it something we should be getting here in South Africa? So Regeneron, uh, Regeneron is a company that's been making a cocktail of different antibodies. Now, we know antibodies quite well from its use in HIV and in other diseases like rabies. In this particular instance, they have a cocktail of antibodies that include targeting the spike protein. Now, these antibodies are currently in clinical trials, and their first set of data hadn't even come out uh, when, uh, well, if it had come out, I hadn't seen it, uh, when it was announced that the president was receiving it. We have subsequently seen some very preliminary data, which are interesting. Uh, they're not definitive by any means. But I think uh, we know from other diseases like Ebola that you, when you use uh, these antibodies, they can have quite a marked effect in that they can reduce the period of infectiousness, they reduce the amount of virus, they re reduce the severity of illness. I was a bit surprised with this treatment, I have to admit, because you know we have generally gone with the evidence from the recovery trial, and so a, a drug like dexamethasone is usually provided to patients who have you know uh, an oxygen deficit, who have low saturations. So I was a bit surprised. Either he did have a low saturation that we don't know about, or that they gave him that drug, what we would consider prematurely. But other than that, his treatment was, you know, aggressive, but within uh, the acceptable parameters of how we would treat a patient. And now turning to the latest stats here in South Africa, uh, we've, we've got up this graph that I know was part of your presentation, which is cases, admissions and deaths to the 7th of October. It's a rolling seven-day average. Um, you know, we're in level one now. We have been for over a week. We've been in level two for a few weeks before that. And we've been warned repeatedly that we should expect something of an uptick. And if I look at that dark line, the darkest line, it looks like it's going up. So is it going up? significantly, is it something that should be raising alarm bells? Yeah, so when you look at our curvature, you know, we initially had a very rapidly growing epidemic. So we should have expected to have our peak in about April this year, uh, maybe, you know, early May at the latest. But because of the very early action that was taken, we actually pushed back the point at which we had our peak. Now that we are over the peak and we are now in a period of, you know, we can call it endemic transmission or low transmission or the trough, however you want to refer to it, but we, pretty, we have a pretty low level of transmission at the moment. In that situation, we will likely see small uh, increases, and those are driven by locations where there are small outbreaks or where transmission has picked up again. And often that's driven by, you know, just the movement of people and the release of restrictions and people lowering their guard and becoming complacent. And that little uh, uptick that you see at the end of that graph of that black line that's concerning you, that's actually being driven by two provinces. It's being driven principally by the Northern Cape and by the Free State. Both those provinces you know, are seeing more cases than you know, a province like KwaZulu-Natal, even though they are much smaller. And so they're probably going through a little bit of an uptick. It's not clear whether there's anything to be concerned about. At this stage, you know, we're just monitoring the situation. There's been an additional emphasis on ensuring that people are following the rules. Uh, in terms of hand hygiene, you know, mask wearing and social distancing. And we would expect that that will likely go away. If it doesn't, then, of course, you know, we'll have to deal with that. 
given that these are you know less dense provinces and so not as big a concern as we would be if it was in Kauteng. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for that update on our figures and also the very interesting discussion about science and uh, the age of science in the COVID era. That was Professor Salim Abdul Karim, chairperson of or the co-chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19. Let's move.